welcome to the Queens County Board of Education School Board meeting for January 5th, 2022. Do I have a motion to? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County will meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice, to, con to consult with staffs, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. second. Oh, All those in favor say aye. Aye. Ayes have it, we'll be back at six o'clock. The Queens County School Board meeting for January 5th, 2022. Can we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, do I have approval of the agenda? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to amend the agenda to add 8.05 new course approval? So mentioned. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. It's been approved. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the amended agenda? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, if everybody had time to look at the closed session minutes for December the 1st? Yeah. Yes, sir. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the December 1st, 2021 closed session meeting minutes? Second. A motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, I also have closed, I'm sorry, closed, I have the open work session for December the 1st. Minutes, has everybody had a chance to look at them? Yes. 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 Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the December 1st, 2021 open work session meeting minutes? Second. A no motion and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye Carrie. Okay, moving on, uh, board involvement. Um, start, Helen. You want sure. To um, well, I <laughs> had a great time. I went to uh, Queen Anne's County High School to participate with the Honors Arts Group to make wreaths. Um, that they were putting up at the Hope Warehouse in Stevensville. The uh, students were lovely and just engaging and they were just so much fun and so talented and so complimentary of my pathetic <laughs> little wreath. But um, <laughs> so that was really nice. And then still wreath related as I did go to the wreaths across America where Mattapique Elementary and Middle School came out. And oh my goodness, um, I had been by myself, but I was just so proud of all those students. They were just, oh my gosh, you know, just lining and waving the flags and some had really big flags and the 18, it was so touching um, and uh, so educational. And I'm sure, you know, they watch that little video before they go out. So very neat experience, I think for everybody, but I was really grateful that the um, principals invited me. So thank you very much. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, hope everybody had a good holiday and happy new year. I'm looking forward to uh, getting in school, right? Without, yes. Uh, all right. Snow. And uh, without snow. snow, right. Yeah. And, um, and that's it. So welcome back. I'm glad to be back. Well, I'd like to, I was uh, at a couple of schools this uh, December with Dr. Salins when she was reading some books on elementary school kids. <laughs> and I must say, she's got a teacher in her. <laughs> Uh, very passionate, very interesting. Um, I understand the book now and everything, but uh, we had a good time and I, I appreciate you attending those schools. And I think that does a lot for the morale of the kids. Also on the 17th of December, uh, I was invited to attend a round uh, table just to listen as far as discussion our budget workshop along with uh, Phil Dumanel, one of our county commissioners. Very interesting. Um, the way Dr. Shalins did the presentation and then listened to the staff, principals, and different people when you went around this way, everybody had ideas, but when you came back the other way, there was some corroborative, and people actually saw what other people needed. So it's going to be a tough year. It's going to be a tough budget like it is every year, but, uh, you know, we're, we're marching ahead on that. That's what I... 
So uh, I attended the Queen Anne's County Retired School Personnel Association luncheon on Tuesday, December 14th at Prospect Bay with Dr. Salins and uh, Ms. Hudock. It was a lovely event. It was so nice to see some familiar, oh, some, I want to say old faces, some um, retired faces and um, <laughs> felt very sad for those that have, have are no longer with us. So um, God bless them. Um, but it, we had a beautiful time, a nice lunch, and, and thank you for, for Prospect Bay for hosting that. I also would like to thank the county commissioners for the vote um, it, it, two meetings ago to, uh, to give the stipend um, to all of the staff at Queen Anne's County uh, CPS. Um, we've had some several letters. I'm sure that they have too, thanking them for it. But I, I think from the board, we all really appreciate that they took the time to do that. And, and God bless. And it, it was very, very needed for everyone. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, so trying to catch up a little bit, as uh, Ms. Bennett noted, we have some very talented children, uh, sorry, students in our county. Um, I attended the Settlersville Middle School Band and Chorus Concert, which was excellent. Um, the Queen Anne's County Dance Concert, which was the first I'd ever been to, even having a daughter who graduated from there. It was really interesting, saw a lot of new stuff that was just amazing. And then the Ken Island High School had Student of the Month. That was amazing to just notice why teachers were selecting students to be the student of the month. The biggest um, factor was they made the teachers' lives easier mm -hmm. and they helped out their fellow students and that was the reason why a lot of them got chosen. It was really interesting to see and I had a good time visiting with all of those. So Awesome. Dr. Yes, um, well, December was a very busy month and it's one of my favorites because I do get to see our students who perform at various levels and so kudos to uh, Michael Bell and all of his efforts with all of his teams to be able to um, let our students just students shine and, and show us their talents that they have. So I was able to be out there with many of you um, as well as um, enjoy some of the things that Mr. Bell kind of pushed out that maybe were more vir virtual in nature. Um, and we're highlighting. We also got, to, I got to read uh, every school but one at this point, so that was very exciting. Um, love, love being in the classroom, um, certainly is a passion for me. And um, yeah, oh, I had one more thing and now my mind is just gone. I have one more thing. Oh, we'll come, okay. we'll we'll come if you come yeah. back. <laughs> back to me. Okay, uh, Assistant Superintendent Report. Uh, Hudock is not here. Would you like to stop up? Yep, Ms. Power Orders is going to step order. Good evening, President Smith, board members, executive team. Um, Amy is not here today, so I am going to um, present the spotlight. <laughs> it's okay. It's in the spotlight, so there you go. I know, right? <laughs> Okay, December spotlights. Um, first thing we'll do is elementary school. As you can see, Bayside Elementary celebrated their December PBIS event. Students got to go scooter sledding, <laughs> which looks fun, and had a hot chocolate snack if they purchased the event with their Bayside Bucks. Centerville Elementary, they had some great artists over there, it looks like. Um, the blended pre-K students participate in their service learning by collecting donations for the local animal shelter. And students also gave kindness smiles away as part of the December's kindness lesson. Churchill Elementary, um, two excited young ladies there, learning um, and fun at the same time is always a win. Churchill Elementary students participated in a STEM challenge in Learning Lab led by Mr. Moore. Using gumdrops and toothpicks, students created structures. They were challenged with seeing how high their designs could be. Very cute. Graysonville Elementary. On December 14th, GES Visa students sang nine holiday songs to the retired Queen Anne's County Public School teachers at their annual holiday party at Prospect Bay Country Club. It was adorable. I heard it was, it was adorable. And we sang with them, by the way. Oh, you did? I'm sorry. I didn't get <laughs> a sing along I should have added together. that in. I apologize. No, that's okay. No, that's okay. I did fun. speak with a couple of the students, and they had it's so fun. much fun. I mean, they outdid us by sure, you know, but. Some of us okay. don't want to be remembered. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, Kennard Elementary. Maryland Humanities visited Kennard Elementary School on December 16th to speak to the fourth graders about how to approach their upcoming research project for social studies. Kennard students will be picking one famous Marylander from the 1600s up to the 1860s to be represented on the next state quarter. This project is going in conjunction with Maryland History Day this upcoming spring. Ken Island Elementary, lots of fun and uh, looks like they had some spirit week uh, as well. The pronouns and noun mittens on the left, gingerbread houses being made, and then kindergarten smiles. <laughs> so cute. Mattapique Elementary, once again, um, supported the annual wreaths across America, passed through to Arlington National Cemetery. I know that's a very moving day and many people participated in that. Southersville Elementary, one more way to get outside and get some exercise. They've been having Wellness Wednesdays each week during the month of December. On Wednesdays, students and staff wear their workout gear and make healthy, physical, mental, and social choices. The teachers incorporate mindful breathing te techniques, yoga poses, and extra cardio into their lesson plans. This is a lifting morale and getting us into shape at SES. Now on to middle schools. Centerville Middle achieves success tutoring program. Centerville Middle School students have been invited to participate in the after school achieve success program. They're excited to be able to offer this opportunity for students to work with CMS tutors to strengthen their academic skills. The achieve success program occurs every Wednesday from 3.30 to 4.30. Students have an opportunity to be a part of a small group of students who receive individualized support on all subjects by providing re-explanation of challenging concepts, assistance with skills practice, and or research-based intervention program. We highly recommend that students continue to take advantage of this academic opportunity. Mattapique Middle, they too participate in the Reads Across America. You can see a lot of them properly wearing their masks too, which is nice even though it's outside. Stevensville Middle School. The Stevensville Middle School Band marched in the Centerville Christmas Parade on December 3rd. Southersville Middle, they had lots going on. In December, the Southersville Middle School Performing Arts Program was on showcase. On December 3rd, the band marched in the annual Centerville Holiday Parade. On the 13th, the, um, they held their winter concert in the Queen Anne's County High School Auditorium. During the concert, there were performances by the beginning band, the concert band, the chorus, and for the first time, the strings ensemble. A great time was had by all. A lot of very talented students. And finally, onto the high schools, Ken Island High School. Lots of talent there as well. Amazing dance, chorus, band, and ugly sweater contest. <laughs> Always very important for December. And Queen Anne's County High School. The FBLA sponsored canned food drive. 2,694 items donated by staff and students. There, were so, there was so much food that they had to go to, from two pantries to five pantries, all the way from Southersville up to Graysonville. This is the largest amount of pantries we have stocked since 10 years ago. Wow. Great, great job. And last but not least, the superintendent holiday card winner. This is the one I forgot. <laughs> so <laughs> it can move my old brain, but there you go. <laughs> so Dr. Salins, if you'd like to elaborate, I know. Um, yeah, it was just really exciting. So um, under the direction of Michael Bell, um, he did a contest that out to the teachers and whoever wanted to participate could. It wasn't mandatory and many students chose to participate. And so then they you know, brought me all this artwork that was beautiful and talking about painful decision-making. Um, this was painful decision-making 101 um, but you can see the artwork on the right hand side I got to talk to um, the teacher as well to learn about what they were doing which was kind of depth perception they're creating depth and um, and the use of their color schemes um, by blending colors together and uh, it was just exciting it was so much fun and um, and uh, and her parents were so gracious and her little brother was there and it was just wonderful and it's actually on the front page of the paper so um, kudos and there's um, also 
a video on the website, I believe. Yes. You presenting. Yes. And it's amazing that, that our work was done by a third grader. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great job. I mean, I, I, it's just amazing. As I said, it was a very difficult decision, but my goodness, she's quite talented, and I hope she continues to pursue that through her educational career. Absolutely. And that's all I have for you. Good, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Due to the inclement weather, I'm as our school board members are not here this evening. They'll be back with us on March meeting. Uh, citizen station, do we have anybody? No. Hey, we have nobody signed up for citizens participation. Okay, our next one will be informational items. We'll start off with our COVID-19 update. Yeah, so board members, I normally would be bringing an update to you from our state numbers on positivity rates, and two things I'd like to elaborate on that. One, the state actually um, was hacked, for lack of better words, and their data was compromised on um, their website, and they have not gotten their um, website back up and running, and this has been quite some time now, um, so we don't have that state-level data. And two, um, we're really kind of moving away from that positivity rate and really looking at other indicators. We've, we've learned a lot through this pandemic, I mean, we're, we're coming up on two years um, and uh, we've learned some very effective uh, strategies for mitigation. We've, we've learned how to isolate um, and quarantine properly and we've continuously modified that. And if that's anything that we've learned is that during this pandemic, we have to continuously be reevaluating and reevaluating and reevaluating to making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students and keeping our staff and students certainly safe at the same time. Um, so um, that's kind of a, a different update. I don't necessarily have numbers for you right now, although we are still tracking it locally, uh, positivity rates within the schools, and I am meeting with Dr. Ciotola on a regular basis to discuss um, individual schools, and that's what I kind of would like to bring to the forefront this evening, is that we really are looking at individual school um, positivity rate as it relates to staffing and students um, and making those determining factors of um, if there was an opportunity where we would have to shut down because we weren't able to staff a building appropriately um, to keep our, our, our students and staff safe. Um, I did want to take note to uh, Mr. Chaudhary, who is our state superintendent um, for face coverings. This was brought to your attention um, as uh, the state board did meet to put into uh, emergency legislation to create the masking mandate that we're under right now. That mandate would, would be up on February 25th, so the state met to petition for another um, emergency legislative mandate. They actually met today and passed that. And so I just kind of wanted to bring to your attention the executive summary in your document. Um, and as opposed to having a blanket statement of masking or not masking, they're basically saying, we're gonna provide to you some quote unquote off ramps so that if you meet certain criteria, then the uh, superintendent can, um, in collaboration obviously with the, the board and the, and, and the uh, health department, make the decision to remove the masking mandate um, until such time that it wouldn't meet that criteria anymore where you'd have to remask. Um, right now, we don't meet that criteria. So we don't really need to kind of entertain and walk through the process of what would it look like to um, to kind of unmask. Um, but the, the ways that you can off ramp, there's three different ways they're clearly articulated. Um, I don't want to kind of summarize them too much to a point where, because I think you really need to digest them and they are on there for the public. So if the public has access, they can read them. Um, but you'll see the three scenarios, um, at least 80% of the uh, population of the county. It also talks about, uh, or 80% of vaccinations for your students and staff members. And those are all documented through your health department and such. Um, but if you meet certain criteria or 14 days uh, consecutive of moderate or low transmission um, rate of cases. Um, so those are all things that we could talk about, but we're not there right now. So um, as soon as, and when we get there, which I'm very hopeful we will get there, I certainly will be um, meeting and briefing with the board to talk about if, if there's an opportunity to remove masking, that, that would be the time that I would bring it to your attention. But right now we all know that we're in the middle of a spike and that we're not gonna be entertaining um, removing the mask mandate at this time, so. And this is uh, 601 on our 
mm -hmm. agenda. So anybody in the public that wants to look at this, read it, can review it and see that. You know, everything's in detail of what's been proposed by the state superintendent of schools. Correct. And as I said, the they, uh, legislation did meet and voted today. And so I'm quite certain that we'll be seeing something tomorrow um, formally that comes out to um, formalize these recommendations basically from the State Board of Education. But this certainly provides background information and the purpose and everything. And, and another one will be posted Educate. tomorrow when whatever the what, state mandates can go on the state board and, yes. and see that every day. Yes, whatever comes down from the state, um, Mrs. Power, Ms. Power Waters will take the opportunity to make sure that it's published. Okay. And I just wanted to add, I know I've already had mentioned it, I, I have a real concern about the disparity between how we treat vaccinated and unvaccinated, that's just me. But um, I did read a statement by Dr. Robert Redfield, who used to be a CDC director, and he's now a senior um, advisor for uh, Governor Hogan, that um, we have 32% of our current COVID deaths over an eight week period in the fall were fully vaccinated. And they anticipate seeing more of the COVID people who are vaccinated, um, those deaths rising as more people get vaccinated. So, you know, just to, I love that we're looking at other factors because, uh, you know, Omicron is just, I mean, it's just out there. I don't know of anyone who's not been sick over the holidays, it seems like. So, you know, just to keep in mind that um, as we move forward to not have that inequity, you know, to we have to pay attention to this vaccination versus non-vaccinated because 32%, I mean, that's a full third deaths are fully vaccinated. That's a huge number. And I'd just like to reiterate, you know, we need to keep our students in school. And I've had some emails from some people recently requesting why we would do this and that. I think Dr. Salins has a handle on this, and I think safety is a priority. We have staffing issues that would be a priority. But it also would be a school-by-school school thing, I think, as you've mentioned before. Um, you know, we want to keep these students in school learning and we'll do what we can if, if Dr. Salins finds it at a period. And I'm hearing now with the state of emergency, Emergency. It could even be done by the uh, local health officer. Correct. Uh, with the Governor Hogan doing the state of emergency, D Dr. C could shut our schools down if he so desired. That's not the case. He's in contact with Dr. Sandlin at all times. And, you know, we'd like to keep him open, but safety and concerns. And like, like Helen said, and the thing is a revolving door and we're a completely different situation now than we were a year ago. We know a lot more about it mm -hmm. and we're reacting, uh, I think very appropriately. And uh, I hope you all have confidence in, in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything on that? No, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Our next thing is Advanced Placement Programs Policy 602, second reading. Mike. Happy New Year, everyone. Hello. Hey. Hi. Happy New Year. President Smith, Dr. Sealens, board members, executive team. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Page. I'm a curriculum supervisor. I am here to present to you the Advanced Placement Programs Policy. This policy is up for second read. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, and I touched base with Ms. Passan, who has been helping to um, kind of uh, go through the policy process. And she said there are no comments in regards to this policy at this point. Um, so, uh, and if you all have any comments, um, I would gladly take them and I can give them to Ms. Passon and we can review them for the, for the I final third action. I'm particular about the um, program, but I just had a quick question because our next one is about the um, fund balance. I don't know if you're presenting it, but just because I noticed on the background it said that it was posted on the, the, the public school website for 30 days for public comment. Did, it didn't say that on the background of this one. Did we also have this particular one up on the website? For they they days? did, because okay. uh, there was no comment, yeah. so it was there. But we, okay. did, we should, that's a good catch though. We need to make sure that each one has that. Board, Board Docs has a link too, where you can see where it's posted on, on our website too. Because I had it in paper, I didn't look at it. But right, I know sure. we said it on the next one, but we didn't say it on this yeah. one, so I wasn't sure if we had. I assuming we're posting them all. Yes. Okay. But we Thank certainly you. need to make that more clear. Does any board members have any questions? No. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> should have picked this fund balance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 603 fund balance, Dane Towers. 
Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Salins, board members. Tonight I bring before you for a second read the fund balance policy, policy number 305. A little background, this is a second read. It's been posted on the QACPA website for over 30 days. Uh, basically, this purpose of this policy is to establish a target range for the general fund unassigned fund balance. And I'll take any, um, there's been no comments posted as of yet, as we said, so. Any questions on this? No, I, I personally think it's long overdue because mm -hmm. when we have a $100 million budget, over $100 million, um, and things can come up, major things. And, you know, I, I, I like the idea of being able to, we need a fund balance. We've used it in the past, um, different opinions on what for. Uh, but uh, it's something I think, you know, any, any prudent business, and we are a business, we're a company, uh, has to have some kind of guidelines. I think this is great. I don't know what other members. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Towers. And you've had no comments from anybody? None. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Towers. Matt Evans. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Salem, board members, executive team. For the record, my name is Matt Evans, supervisor of student services. I got distracted now. I can't get this. Uh... Scroll down to the bottom and it'll pop up. Thank you. Sorry about that. I have pre uh, two presentations for you tonight. The first one being the student enrollment report <laughs> that was submitted to MSDE, as also known as the, the September 30th count. Uh, so the purpose is we want to just make you aware of, the, of that data and also look at uh, the enrollment data, particularly with home instructed students in Queen Anne's County. Um, look at those uh, data trends as well as gain an understanding of, of how enrollment data works because there's a couple things in here. So here's a grid of our actual enrollment for the 21-22 the, uh, school year. And you'll notice that there's, there's columns of itinerant, pre s and pre-K, and that's important because those students are actually not funded, so we pull them out um, of our account that we send to MSDE. So when you look at this this fall enrollment here, uh, it shows we actually gained some students. However, when we compare our enrollment data um, after pulling out our itinerant students in the three-year-old programs and the four-year-old programs, we're actually down about 47 students this school year. Um, I, we do have it broken out by school and by year, uh, the fall enrollment. The grid kind of gives a, a better picture. And you can see that we did have a significant increase in our, in our three-year-old programs, which is we ended up pulling more of those students back out of the count. But you can see that certainly at Centerville Elementary, at Ken Island Elementary, and Sellersville Elementary where those programs were expanded. Middle school enrollment, for the most part, three of the, the four middle schools have decreased. Their trend is decreasing in enrollment. Rheumatic Peak Middle um, has remained more or less the same as currently on an increase. High school enrollment really, for the most part, has remained fairly steady with actually a little bit of a decline at Canaan High School and a slight increase at Queen Anne's County High School. Enrollment by ethnicity, you can see the majority of our students are white, um, although those numbers are decreasing. Uh, black students and Asian remaining around the same, but we are seeing a, a, an increased trend in the multi-race students and Hispanic students. Home instruction data by year, certainly this is really what has impacted us the past two years with COVID. Um, you can see in the green, that's, that's last year, and we had a huge increase in students who transferred to home instruction. Um, so that has decreased this year. However, you'll see that you know our enrollment is still kind of down, and some of those students, and I'll have in the conclusion, we believe have moved to a private school. Uh, looking at home instruction data by grade, the, it, the uh, home instruction, transfer to home instruction decreased in all grade levels except for third and 12th. But for the most part, by each grade, uh, home instruction, students enrolled in home instruction is down. 
And again, so the conclusion is we're, we're down 47 students as compared to last year. Um, really, this can be attributed to students that uh, were in home instruction and ultimately went to a private school. They didn't all come back to us like we were hoping. So that's still an, an issue that we're addressing. Um, and in general, we're down, you know, as far as students enrolled in home instruction, they decreased by 100, 163 students. Questions? It looks, it looks like to me, and you just said it, our elementary and middle schools are down. Our high school is not. Correct. And I guess I can <laughs> relate this to Dr. Salins. This keeps up, and all of a sudden, in high school, we start getting an influx of students in September one year. What's our plan? Well, our schools are almost capacity in high school, but our, our details showing the lower grades aren't. But, you know, we could have, a, I'm just scared we got a big influence of high school students some year. Do you feel that or not a big problem? I, I don't see that it's going to be that big. I don't think it'll be enough. I mean, you know, enough, you know so. they're in private school and also they come back for their high school years. But, right, but yeah, because like, of the my credit. Concern. And, and we had Aaron. students leaving high school for private school and home instruction right. as well. Yeah, because, I mean, private schools are good. I've got no problem with that. But, you know, there, there's a bigger pool in, in, in public schools and different things are offered. I just wonder, especially in our county, because we're limited to how many high schools we have are private. And I just, you know, it just, you know, I don't know what we would do if we had extra two or 300 kids come to high school. Yeah, I don't, I don't foresee that don't happening. That? No, okay. I, I don't think any of the data, the long-term or projection data is showing that okay. um, increase for our overall area. Um, I do think that we've had more students kind of ebb and flow for lack, you know, some that leaving that typically would and some that are coming in. My bigger concern is that we thought we were gonna recuperate this year and we didn't. Now we're going on two years of, you know, our decrease in enrollment. And my concern is that you got two years where then that becomes a, a way of life for some. Mm -hmm and they've you know, chosen and, and made it work for their family. And so if we're able to get out of the pandemic next year and we come back to a completely normal situation, I don't think we're gonna recuperate that many students because I think some of them have just chosen that path and they're comfortable and they're doing well where they are. And so um, you know, for their family, that's working. And that, that's my concern. I, I, I don't know that it's gonna impact us, especially at the high school level as it relates to um, overall enrollment okay. increases. I mean. I mean, you know, enrollment, you know, is, is a concern, but if the parents and students are doing good somewhere else, right, exactly. that's great. I'm glad they yep. are, and, 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 and that's their choice, and that's good. Uh, I just would, I, I just concerned that, you know, we, you know, kids, all, end of August, September, you have enrollment. I just, you know, yeah. but if you and don't have that, if that's not a concern, then... And we did put in the virtual option this year. Um, we, we were a little slow moving trying to get our, our you know, understanding of it. And, and, you know, we weren't 100% by any stretch. We had some growing pains, just mm -hmm. like I think many other districts did. Uh, I think we'll be on a more solid foot next year as we roll into that virtual instruction. We may capture some more students in that, that realm that works for them. But I still don't think it'll be significant enough to show an increase um, overall of this loss of 163 kids. Agreed. So can I ask a question? Uh, what our <clears throat> student capacity at Queen Anne's County High School is twelve hundred. Yes. And as I remember, Ken Island was built for eleven 1 hundred, and then we built on the ninth grade annex, and that gave us an alleviation of uh, three hundred. Yes. So, your concerns are about having an overcrowding at either school. If you look at the numbers, they they don't. There's only like nine hundred coming in to Queen Anne, and about. 800 going into Ken Island, so we have plenty of room. Oh, I understand that. What, what my concern was, when these students are going to private schools and other homeschooling at the younger years, when they get, in, when they get into the senior year, the high school, that's when they might want to come back to a high school setting. Well, even with these know, numbers, I mean, there's... Well, these numbers, but I was thinking if, if it's not an issue, it's not an issue. Yeah. That's what's concerning well, me, that they might come back at a later date. That's I all. wonder if they're still going to come back, just because a lot of them... Um, there are less opportunities, I think, in the private sector, private schools for high school. Sports, sure. But a lot of them move it because of sports. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if sports is interrupted like it's been the last two years, that yeah. may absolutely negatively mm -hmm. affect. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we do, you know, projections out even 10 years out, and we look at everything within our community as it relates to growth overall. And uh, we, there's certain formulas and calculations and I won't at all try to be an expert at that, but um, we have a pretty good, I think, idea 
of how the community is going to grow and what parts of our community are going to grow. So, we um, so I, I think we're we're pretty steady in those projections, um, or pretty flat, I should say. We don't have a whole lot of growth. So, um, well, not with all the 55 and older coming into well, Kent Island. Uh, there's not going to be a big influx of Kent Island, any of the schools on down well, our way. Well, the only thing is, when you have a 55 and over community. Um, Four Seasons themselves did a presentation and said 80% of the people who bought in Four Seasons already lived in the county, mm -hmm. which means they sold their family homes yep. to yes. move so into the move 55 and over community, which means all those family homes are now open for new yes. families with children. So they, that's a whole other <coughs> issue, but they are impacting all of those, um, the things that they didn't help pay for. Um, and so we still have, going to have plenty, not plenty, but opportunity to have new families move in. Have growth in our population, yeah. school population. Mm -hmm. well, we right. continue to look at it. And it makes, I think, Jane, you said earlier when you were talking about numbers with the state because it's on your, and you're talking from the funding side, every county's facing this issue as far as decreasing enrollment. It's not Queen Anne's County facing this decline. It's every county in the state, except it's, you said one maybe is not, but every one is pretty much doing it. Correct, and they've been seeing it over two years as two years. well. Who's not? I want to say Carol, but I'd have to look into that. Maybe Matt might know. But, but when you got 22. No, I don't know. I thought it was every every district myself. But. Well, 22 out of 23 is almost every. So, I mean, even, <laughs> yeah. if, even if you pick out one, it's still, yeah. it's, yeah. it's not just Queen Anne's County. So I don't want anybody to think that we're losing. I mean, it's, a, you know, it's just what's going on with the world today and the, and the state. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you. Um, I'm, I believe my... Uh, I'm still yeah, up for the next you're, 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 you're on for another one. Okay. This is this presentation is regarding physical aggression data. Um, as you know, there, there have been um, an increase in, in referrals for fighting and, and physical, physical attack. So the purpose of this, we want to review this data. And what we're doing is comparing the fall of 2019 to this fall in the months from August through November. And it is disaggregated by ethnicity and repeat offenders. <clears throat> So looking at the fall of 2019, there were 11 referrals for physical aggression. And just for clarification, that uh, those referrals are written for fighting or for physical attack, which could be on a student or, or a staff member. Uh, then you look at fall 2021, this past fall, 50 referrals. So a very significant increase. And, and I think we all um, kind of knew, when, even before we pulled this data, that that's probably what we were going to see. There were zero repeat offenders in fall of 2019 and three repeat offenders this fall in three different schools. Um, here's the breakdown by ethnicity. Um, if, if the ethnicity is not listed, then they were not, um, then there was no referrals written for that subgroup in either 2019 or 2021, August through November. Um, I pulled this because I know I was dr trying to find some national data on, on fighting, and that's just not out there right now. The um, Nas National Association for School Resource Officers, they get things like guns on campus, stuff like that, but the lesser, that's just not out yet. So I, I did pull this because it is something that, I, I mean, we know qualitatively, and certainly we, we see it in the news, um, but just in general, teachers and school administrators are saying they're seeing a rise and everything from the minor misbehaviors to fighting in the hallways. Mitigation strategies, so we do adhere to our student discipline regulation and, and fighting and physical attack can, can be our lowest, a level one, all the way up to a level five response. A level five response is police notification. It is removal from school. Um, the most a principal can do is suspend for 10 days and if further action is warranted, then it would be referred to the superintendent. Um, law enforcement, the partnership with the sheriff's office is, is important and, and very beneficial. Um, you know, we, we really uh, appreciate that partnership because they, they are there uh, when they're needed and when requested. Um, also, uh, we use mediation and restorative services. And, and this does not replace a disciplinary consequence. And certainly when students come back, it's important to try and address that conflict and, and you know, and try and prevent and be practiced so that, you know, this, these fights don't continue to happen. <clears throat> Um, certainly we use our, our school counseling offices, other student services personnel, school-based counseling through external mental health providers. Um, 
as well as just referrals for mental health counseling out, outside of school. And I did have one quick question. Mm -hmm. On the um, on slide six where it references the student discipline regulation. Yes. I was looking at that and on one of the pages, um, let me find it, um, on page 22, it looks like the one on tobacco, there's just some strikeouts and then stuff in, in, in bold. Are we in the process of changing this regulation or? No, we, we did recently update it for the fact that we had to include a disciplinary piece for refusal to wear a mask when required to do so. Um, but no, we, there should not. Well, it's still, well I, like I said, I just I opened it up and looked at it and just that page, it had the strikeout still. So it just could be needed. A yeah, so I'll, on the, I'll definitely take a look at that because right now, we're not reviewing or changing anything with, with tobacco. Okay, well, thanks. So Matt, that's a, it's a pretty significant increase between 2019 and 2021. Um, probably the natural inclination is to blame it on COVID and being out of school, uh, you know, the stresses from that. Any indicators why? I mean, is, is that the case that they've been out of school or is it something well, else what, that's going yes, on? Yes, I, I think it's, well, certainly I think we found even down to the kindergarten level where, and I talk with seasoned teachers, mm -hmm. I think students really are learning how to interact with each other again and just not being in the school building and interacting face to face, not on a screen, it's, it's for some of them it's been difficult and a difficult transition and in many cases I think we are kind of reteaching students how to how to appropriately interact with each sure. other. Do we have more information on what grade levels the students are in? Yes, yes, I do have that data. So the, the majority of the, um, were secondary by far. Okay. High school? Yeah, uh, yeah, middle through highs. Okay. And were they more on the fives or were they down in the ones as far as the level? So I would say middle school were more down two and three. High school, there was... More aggressive? Yes, more aggressive. And for high school students, uh, just because I've heard a lot of conversations, um, are we looking at upper level classmates or low? I mean, so the ones that seem that I'm hearing that are having the biggest issues are, and I don't want to blast anybody, but ninth and 10th graders as opposed to 11th and 12th graders. I, I would say that's correct, yes. Is there anything that we can think about that would help that group? because they are, they've missed two years being in person and acting with other people and being able to integrate and interact with other folks. Is there something that we can do to help that, that group? Yeah, so we are partnering with community community mediation upper shore and really what our goal is there is to, to one, be proactive so that staff are understanding how when they can recognize things, maybe um, prevent it, be proactive with a restorative circle or something of that nature, but also just the mediation services alone can help if we know there's a conflict to try and, and have that mediated prior to. And even when school staff this year have tried to mediate prior to a fight, sometimes the fight still happen so there's yes it, it's been a tough learning curve but yes we absolutely are, are actively looking at how to be proactive and okay. assist those students thank you well, it's I mean, a matter of learning the socialization skills and learning how to have interpersonal communication with each other rather like like you said on a monitor Right, so. and, and also social and emotional learning is, is we have zones of regulation K through eight in our, our uh, learning collaborative at the high school level. So yes, it's, we're, we're working on it, but it's, it was. It was a challenging opening of the year. With student behaviors, I think, just in general, them not used to being in the buildings. Yeah. And the zones of regulation, if you're not familiar with that, that's really a way to check in with students to kind of see where they are, um, because really you, you can't teach a student if they're somewhere, you know, they're not ready to receive that learning. Sure. Um, and it also goes with conscious discipline, which is kind of the, for our littles, the conscious discipline kind of um, blossoms into that zones of regulation. Um, so I, I think that's been positive and we certainly continue that professional development for staff. 
um, so that they can kind of really be more in tune to how students are coming in. I mean, you can kind of tell sometimes if somebody comes in and they're distracted. Right. Um, and so how we trying to, to provide professional development on, you know, what do you do in that situation? How can you address that distraction um, so that you can be more proactive? Um, but we do, if you think about it, we have, you know, basically seventh graders who didn't get an experience. Right. Seventh grade is really that year that students um, very much mature through the seventh grade year, have a, kind of an ebb and flow almost of, you know, those elementary behaviors to those secondary behaviors. And, um, you know, as they move into their eighth grade year, they have more of a strong footing and foundation to get ready for high school. Well, unfortunately, our ninth graders missed that opportunity. Yep. So I think that's what we're struggling with right now. I mean, I think that's where... And you know the aggressive behaviors are coming to out of some frustrations I think among our students who are you know um, kind of uh, lagged or have a loss of, of um, you know knowledge and, and how to address certain skills and uh, so yeah I mean I, kudos to Matt and his team and you know we've really looked at our ESSER funds. We've expanded um, to address the social, emotional well-being of students um, by putting additional staff members in, hiring um, social workers, um, be, and help me with the titles of some of them, Matt, because some of those titles uh, are new. Mental health social workers. So we and we currently have one um, in the northern part that is running groups at two different middle schools for uh, groups depending on what the need is at the school. Yeah, and I mean, all of us have been, everybody, I think, has not escaped some kind of connection to COVID. Right. And some of, um, some of our students, and staff members for that matter, but we're talking specifically students, some of them more so than others. Um, and so trying to work through those, they didn't have a, a chance and an opportunity. You know, we're a skip to, uh, we, we have this, most of us have the skill set as adults to address um, how to grieve something or how to work through some frustrations. Um, and, and sometimes our students don't have those skills and that's right. what we need to do. I, is provide them with those, you know, equip them with the skills so that they can address the concerns or being scared or, you know, just all of those feelings that the unknown that COVID has brought for our students. And so we're going to continue to work on that. I know Mr. Evans is also investigating, um, trying to bring some um, guest speakers in for some of our secondary student um, populations to share with them about, you know, social media that has a lot to do with a lot of the aggressive behaviors that we're seeing in schools, the bullying, um, and, and just um, the banter that leads to aggressive behaviors. Um, so bringing in and trying to be combative or, or trying to build awareness, I should say, to combat that mm -hmm. mentality right. that social media is a platform that you should go to in that nature. I mean, you know, I'm sure there's some, I'm sure there's positive things about social media. You know, obviously when we um, look and recognize the talents of our students, Students. Those are great things that we can use, but there's a lot of times for our student body that it's used inappropriately. And so really taking the time to try to educate, build skill level um, around social media, I think that's really what direction we're heading in. And it's, it's just difficult. It's been challenging. It's it, very been it very has. challenging. And I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Our ninth graders are middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. I mean, and our, some of our middle schoolers are elementary school. They've been out of school mm -hmm. for two years. So there's, I mean, besides a learning gap, there's a social gap, I think, that we don't real. I mean, we realize it, but it, it's, it's, it's there. And, mm -hmm. you know, these ninth graders... They were seventh graders when they yeah. last came yeah. back to school. And that's exactly what I hear from the high school council. And I, th I think that's just an amazing thing. Also, I think us as leaders, all up and down the scale, parents and everybody, authority, the respect for authority. And I think, yeah, I'm not going to one thing, but I think people have to understand, you know, kids are sponges. Mm -hmm. They see this. That's and true. if they hear somebody around the dinner table or somebody saying, well, you don't need to do that or you don't have to do that, I understand that. That's a parent's decision. But when you're in a society of everybody going to school, you know, we, we all have to work together. That's right. You know, and, and, and I think that's, I think it's it, it's COVID as far as the the, the, the effects of medical thing is one thing. Um, we just got to, we got to be above it. Yeah. And, and I will say that we're seeing aggressive behaviors that are littles. It's just not to a level like this, you know, of fighting and things like that. But we are seeing some aggressive behaviors at that level. And again, you have a first grader who really may or may not have had part of a pre-K experience. Right. Uh, you have a second grader who, you know what I mean, really, um, they don't have the foundational skills that you, you put them in a frustrational, you know, um, 
w way. So, um, so we are seeing them at the elementary level, just in a different way. Mm -hmm. yeah, you apparently, know, they're seeing, seeing it at the college level too. Maybe really? not the aggression, but really, the yeah. social skills and that kind of thing. Yeah. That's, so yeah. professors that I've spoken with mm -hmm. have related that. Well, so. that makes sense. I mean, really, it does, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. um, the number of attempted suicides also are up in high, in college level. Yeah. It's um, yeah. As I said, so it's so it's not just looking at this one particular data set. It's really mm -hmm. looking at all the pieces that get us there and how do we um, try to kind of put a lot of supports in place, not just one thing, not just the counselors, not just the mediation, not just adding social workers. Like, you know, I think we just really need to put every effort into it um, to kind of support and what I always call wrap around. So sure. put those wrap around services on our on our students. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. so again, just, you know, kudos again to your team and Dr. Salins for you guys being on this because yeah, it's, you know, trying to keep the schools open is huge because that I, we're yeah. seeing consequences of, of so that's off. So yeah. recognizing it, identifying it and trying to come up with some yeah, yeah, right, and we're thankful for the ESSER funds we are that give us the ability to, um, you know, look at programming, look at professional development, look at staffing, and um, so we're thankful that those funds are there, um, and, and for that matter, just supporting, you know, when we come here for things and being supportive, um, the commissioners being supportive, and just like Mr. Smith said, it, all of us have to work together um, because we're all here for the same reason, you know, hence our new hash, or hence our new buy line which is where our future begins, which is our students. We're all here for the same reason, so. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Page, you're up again. <laughs> Hello again. How you doing? Oh. So the next item I have is a informational item. This informational item is ordered uh, to align our AP courses with the state Comer expectations. The curriculum instruction is adjusting the structure of several of our AP courses to meet the requirements of credits received by students. This informational item is to inform the board the courses are not being changed but are being structured to fit within the semester setting in Queen Anne's County. The second piece to this is that the, adjust, the adjustment to provide the ESOL classes meets the state requirement to provide a language acquisition class to identify the EL students at the high school level. <clears throat> This informational item is to inform the board that the courses are not being changed, but are being structured to fit a four year program for students who have been identified all four years. The courses that are being uh, changed are listed within the statement. And just so that the board knows, there is really no financial impact in regards to these changes. It's just kind of structuring it within the semester. Uh, um, and so we just bring this to your information so that you guys are aware of some of the changes that we're, we're creating. I just had a quick question. On the yellow sheets, do they re remain a part of the official record? Do they go in with the regulations and all that? They don't, they're not attached to the regulation, but they're for, forever in here and you have access, right. the public has access to them. Only because the, I, I guess I had, I had to reread that when I was reading the purpose, the first line of the second paragraph, it was a real, I was having a hard time. I do, I think, understand what was being said. And then after reading it a few more times, I'm just wondering if we could, not that it's a big deal, but to just rework that sentence, it kind of does so The adjustment to provide four ESOL classes? Meets the state requirements to provide a language acquisition class to identified EL students at the high school level. It just doesn't, yeah, it's not a big deal. It just doesn't, the sentence doesn't seem to, well, does that make sense? I think it's because people aren't used to using the terms EL and ESOL in a, in a context okay. of a sentence. And because we're educators, to us it makes sense. And I apologize for that. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we tend to use like, terms. What? If we spelled, so if times, we spelled so. out ESOL and EL, I bet to you it would make a lot more sense. All right. I'm Fair sorry. You know, and we can do that. We can certainly no, 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 no. add that. Fine. But it's I think fine. that's why for us, it. And Michelle's here, she wants yeah. to chime in. But for us, it's, you know, that's kind of like, it makes sense to us because we're educators and we use all kinds of crazy terms. <laughs> I think what was throwing, no, I hear you. I think what was throwing me off was the, 
uh, to provide a language acquisition class to identified EL students. And I guess I was thinking it made more sense to say to identify instead of, you do the sense. No, because we all, the class is only that, offered right? to those students who are identified right. and that's a set of criteria. Um, we certainly okay. probably could break it into two sentences and then it would no, make, no, 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 it, no. make a lot, it you know what I mean? So it's not kind of two concepts in one sentence. Identified as being used as an adjective, not as a. Right, and the, but it just took me a little right. while to get yeah. that after. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that was all. <laughs> Can I ask just. And the ladies just, understand. I know it's your, hard. Your, your, we we your make it difficult. I know. We make it difficult. It's easier to talk to a doctor. We, uh, we apologize. Doctor. Is this yeah, mandatory? Okay, do we have good. to do this? Yes. All, this is, this, all this is to meet the state requirements. I, I totally gotcha. have a problem with it. I totally do. Mm -hmm. There's no way to teach AP, AB calculus in one semester. No. There is no way. Uh, my daughter was a math student graduated from LSU with a math degree. There's no way to teach that. In one semester. When I told her that, she was like, you, you gotta be kidding me, you can't do it. So, God bless them, good luck. They did, uh, I'll be honest, the high school committee, which has very good representation on it, looked at every course, and those courses that needed to be paired with um, a prerequisite course, that would be a required course, um, that would um, highlight and enhance some of the curriculum um, were, were put in. So not every AP has like a married course to it, but there are some that they felt the content was such that the students would need some precursor to, so that they would be successful in the AP course itself. And so they would get an elective credit for, um, or, or science credit or however it's labeled, but they wouldn't get an AP credit for that class, but they would be required to take that class prior to sitting in the AP course. I hope that makes sense. It, it's still, it's, so they get, what they it get is. additional, they get the <clears throat> extra semester of prep and prep, you know, um, preparation to be able to, to participate. Can't do anything about it. It's unfortunate. It, it, as I said, it, it's, it's more that you, you can't receive two AP credits for one course. Right. So when you semesterize, well, I understand that's, that. You know, that's that's I understand. the, the uh, state, you know, I, how, how a school system does it. I mean, we could change it and make it a year long course and, and have it um, you know be on a split schedule, a 45 minutes a day schedule, or we could do a 90 minute AB day schedule. I mean, there's a lot of ways to attack it. Um, but this was what the high school assess, uh, high school team felt was. I, I understand. I, I'm worried more about the students learning, mm -hmm. the content, mm -hmm. understanding, um, and then successful, the, and be successful mm -hmm. in their endeavors. That's yeah. I'm thinking about the students. So anyway, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other thank questions? You. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Towers, Jane. Good evening again. Tonight we bring before you for review and information is your monthly expenditure report as of December for um, each of the categories in the general fund. Do we have any any concerns at all about a couple of these categories that have hit almost 97 percent, like student health services, transportation, at this date? And yes, we are looking at them closely. Later on this month, we'll, we will be bringing some budget adjustments to um, identify some of the things we're seeing to get us through the end of the year. Thanks. And that's normal. It, it's, it, it, it's normal. I ask her it every year, too. So. It is, but, but the student yeah. health services, that could be used for ESNER funds, too, right? Pull that, turn that one to right. Um, so we're using some of our funds that we could be reimbursed for, possibly. If, if they qualify for ESNER funds, that is that is the, the route Thank that we go. We go with Palmer restricted Jr. first. Yes, of course. Okay. Some of the student supplies that you see is going to be for water in the house suites, um, epi material, things like that. And, and um, special ed, we are at. That didn't look. I didn't. I, yeah, that's it. Special education. Line six. Line six. Okay. Category six. I thought that would be a higher number. I'm glad it's not. Yeah. So Tammy, you're saying that it's normal that we are at the 90 something percent and that we'll do adjustments. And so we always, we do. Every year doing adjustments we at this do time. We do in category adjustments and. That much. Out of category adjustments. 
I mean, Jane's, excuse yes, me, Ms. Yes. Towers has been excellent and take care oh, of Oh, no, that. this, I absolutely, I, uh, I think, this Towers is amazing. Mm -hmm. That's not my point. It just <laughs> seems like if this is just what we do every year, is yes. every year yes. the same categories are always at this 95%. Yes. At this time of the year, maybe we need to look at right. and, not and having our budget say this um, the way that it does. Right, and well, another reason why it could be that 97 is in addition to the money actually being spent, it's also been encumbered and set aside. Okay, right? okay. Yeah. yes. Thanks. That, that a clear indication of that is your salaries. Yes, yeah, so you look you're at salaries, 96% is done. And, it, it, and you know. it's going to be that way all year long because we're making sure that, that we put that money away so we can pay everybody yes. through the end yes, of the yeah. year. So, so all this year yeah. to date is not money spent. It's money no. either spent so it's or been allocated. Allocated. allocated directly to a certain thing. Correct. It, that's exactly right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if we have to go out of category, then we talk to the commissioners or send a letter. Right. Okay, well, and you know, we get to, sometimes we have to do the reason we have an amendment is because we have actuals that come up, which mm -hmm. are, right. are things that we don't have it. We can't predict um, right. the yeah. spending, you know, like things, um, a lot of things in facilities that we can't predict um, that name. Like maybe, water main breaks. Yes, or phone hey, systems did. going down and things <laughs> like Although that. We still have punchy yeah. in that. Yeah. Hey, so I'm there's something up that had happened. Okay, not going to wood. But, but we do you. look at. Ac actuals every year and trend data and readjust to try to pinpoint the budget as best as possible. And thank you, Ms. Towers, for all your effort with that. Thank yes. you. Okay, any other questions on that? Okay, you're still on. All right, <laughs> the next thing we bring before you is the monthly ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 reports. As you can see with ESSER 2, the amount after spent encumbered is 1.4 million and under ESSER 3, we're trending at over 5.5 of the total 6.8 million. And ESSER 2, the deadline for that is next year? Uh, let's see, 20... 930. 23. 23, right? 23, yeah, 930, 23. Okay, 23. Gotcha. Correct. And at ESSER 2, if you can remember, we did a budget amendment on this to really focus on social distancing, things like that. ESSER 3, the intent of ESSER 3 was to identify the learning loss and things like that. So ESSER 3 will go to 930-24. And I'm assuming we're planning on doing summer school again this summer? Yes, we are. So that Actually, could come out one that will and that uh, almost good. mirror exactly with some enhancements to it from uh, last year. Starting up actually soon to be identified and so. Yes. And under ESSER 3, correct. Right. Any other questions? When will we know about that as, as far as a budget for that? May, June? For summer school? Yes. It'll be before then. Um, I, I don't have an exact date, but I know that, that uh, as I said, it's going to be a mirror almost from last year, so it won't take a lot of effort, I think, to get it. They put so much time and effort last year, they're going to pay, you know, that'll pay off this this year. Yeah. Um, but the CNI team will get together and um, and start building that. Um, I would say March is probably a good target date for that. Okay. Just asking. Any other questions? Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Ms. you. Towers. Our next thing in front of you, which you'll have things as our eight, I'm sorry, no, 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 901 now, or 801, sorry, 801. Uh, oh, you for, mean, are you missing over the break completely, Mr. Smith? Break, you want a break? Uh, just asking, it's on we're, the agenda. We're, we're, we're running this show. Okay. Through. <laughs> God bless you. Cancel the break. <laughs> Mike needs to get home. He's been up here three times. He's nice still waiting. Uh, Human resource report. Everybody's had a chance to review that and uh, look at it. Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to accept the human resource and sub substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session? Second. A motion is second. All those in here say aye. 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 Ayes have it. <coughs> Good evening, President evening. Smith, Dr. Salins, board members, executive team. For the record, my name is Jolene Smith. I'm the supervisor of special education. Um, I bring before you this evening the following item for action. Uh, this is a request for approval for tuition payment to the Phillips School in the amount of $35,717.94. This is not a new placement, but a change in placement from one placement to another. 
um, it does not create a negative impact on the projected expenditure that was originally proposed um, in July of the current fiscal year. Um, and then this expense would come from the unrestricted operating budget. So the previous one was 35,717 and we're just transferring this to another school? It was a little bit more from one school to this one. So it's actually a decrease. Yes. yes. So the other one would get, and I, I'm assuming getting credit for what, since we're not in that school anymore, we just didn't, we get credit for it or hadn't paid it yet or something. You pay it monthly. So we have not incurred a co that cost. Okay. Any further questions? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the non-public tuition for student attendance at the Phillips School? Fiscal impact dollar amount of $35,717.94. Uh, budgeted from the FY22 unrestricted operating budget. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion is second. Any further discussion? All those may say aye. Aye. Aye, Savit. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Thank, you. Thank you for coming in. Sid. Yes. Defender. Defender. All right. Good evening, uh, President Smith, um, Dr. Salem, board members for the record, Sid Pender, Chief Operating Officer. Um, I'm filling in for Ms. Pullen tonight, who could not be in, uh, it was in, unable to attend, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, tonight we're seeking approval um, of the contract with Horde Copeland and Mott HCM to provide architectural design services for the roof replacement of Ken Island High School. Um, this is necessary documentation information for the roof replacement. Uh, they complete pre-design survey, develop drawing, specifications for state submission and approval, um, technical services through bidding construction phase of the project. Um, all of these right, or, um, rates are predetermined in um, an indefinite quantity contract that we did several years ago. So they're already pre-bid um, and approved on that part. Seeking approval to move forward with $45,110 um, from the FY21 capital budget. And this will probably take about two years, not this part, but the actual roof replacement is such a major project at Ken Island High School, it'll probably take two years. So it'll be done pretty much in the summertime? Yeah, it'll be done in the summertime, yes, sir. May I ask if we, Ms. Towers, do we have this allocated in the capital budget for 2021? Yes. Yeah. And what happens because we hear of prices escalating at what, do we have any chance of coming in close to budget? Mm. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, you're just I fine. I, I, I at this anyway. point, I would probably say no. There's no realistic expectation. Um, I would also say that it may also, it, it will take two years to do it in the summertime because you don't want to disrupt the students, mm -hmm. but also funding of it from the state because it's escalated so much, it's probably going to take a two-year process. So they've kind of changed up what they're doing and you're able to kind of, you know, whatever you don't use, save for the next year to move forward. And that's, so it, it, it should work out, you know, to be a two-year project. And that's probably in our benefit right now, the prices that the rates are everything going. But doing this right now will hold us, I mean, this will be good for two years out to yeah, so and stuff what, like that. Well, yes, so what we want to do is by, um, you know, put it out to bid and have that come in later on in the spring so we can get those companies lined up now so when school gets out, we can go ahead and hit it. But that would be locked in at that, yes, sir. Gotcha. So did we uh, go, did we get three different estimates on this? So this is the this? IDIQ. So oh, all of the okay. architectural firms about two years ago were pre-bid out. So they come in at the rates and we select three groups so we can go with any of them. We've had a lot of success with um, with Hort Coplin um, and Mock, they've done several of our school buildings before design. Any other questions? Mr. Smith, may I make a motion to approve the contract with Hort Coplin Mock <coughs> to provide architectural design services for the roof replacement at Kenallan High School. Fiscal impact dollar amount of $45,110. Budget source FY 2021 capital. Second. A motion is second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. Next one, Mr. Pender, is a bus. 
Yes, um, seeking approval tonight for uh, Mr. Aaron Mitchie of the Nor Northern County Exchange LLC to purchase a used bus for the 2021-22 school year as an unpaid spare. There is no cost associated with a PVA or anything like that. Um, it's not uncommon for each uh, LLC to have several spares just in case one breaks down, then the other contractors will rent that bus from, from them. There's no nothing no cost associated with this except for you know it does go on our insurance but other than that there's no PVA or, or any of that allocated to that it's just kind of a standard uh, procedure to have you approve that and this is a 2009 bus so it's 11 years old 12 years old to get about three more years, three more out, years of, yep, out of it to get to the 15 year mark okay any further to... no sir you have a motion Sir, may I uh, make a motion to approve Mr. Aaron Michi of the Northern County Exchange to purchase a used bus for the 2021-2020 school year to be used as an unpaid spare, no budget implications. Second. A motion second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye seven. Thank you. Okay, we're running down to the end. Now we have the new uh, thing, our CTE. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> I've seen you before. <laughs> I think the supervisor tagged you a bit just tonight. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hello again. How you uh, I'm here um, on behalf of Mr. Adam Tolley, who was not able to be here today. Um, so I am bringing forward for your approval the um, technology from the technology education category, um, the computer science discovery. Uh, just a little bit of background in regards to this. Traditionally, all CTE pathways in Maryland were required to have four courses with at least four credits. Uh, last year, MSD relaxed that this requirement for selecting pathways, including the computer science. Therefore, a formal request was sent to MSD to amend the computer science pathway from four to three courses, eliminating the final course. As a result, an opening was created in our, for our instructions uh, to teach an additional course. The CTE supervisor collaborated with the instructors at both high schools to create the, the um, <clears throat> computer science discovery course, which will fulfill the technology education graduate graduation requirement. And then there should be a brief description of what that course entails. Does anybody have any questions on this? No. <clears throat> Smith, may I make a motion to approve the new course, computer science discoveries? Fiscal impact uh, dollar amount, none. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. A motion, a second, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Page. Thank you Thank for you. everything you've done tonight. Appreciate you, sir. Uh, no citizen. No, sir. Yeah, we have none of that. Okay, our future meetings, will, next Wednesday we will have a budget workshop. I think that's starting at 4.30. Yes, sir. Then we will have a work session on the 19th. Uh, that'd be a regular work session. And then our next board meeting will be February the 2nd of this year. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Yep. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you for the evening. Mm -hmm.